lab safety biohazards. There are many types of biological hazards that can happen within the workplace. There can be bacterial, fungi, parasites, and viral hazards that can happen. Important viruses that we need to note. These are highly infectious and can be deadly. Infectious pathogens. Pathogens means disease-causing organism, and infection or infectious means the body is invaded with that pathogen. The three major viruses that we are going to talk about are HBV, which stands for hepatitis B virus, HCV, hepatitis C virus, and HIV, which stands for human immunodeficiency virus. HIV is transmitted by blood, semen, and amniotic fluid. Blood is the single most important source for HIV and hepatitis B in the occupational setting. The average healthcare professional is more likely to contract hepatitis B or hepatitis C than HIV. Hepatitis B can be present for extraordinarily present in extraordinarily high concentrations. HIV is usually found in lower concentrations, hence less likely to contract. Hepatitis B can also remain stable in dried blood on a surface at room temperature for up to seven days. HIV is a lot less stable and cannot be contracted or remain on a surface for as long as hepatitis B. Pathogens and infections. Bloodborne pathogen this term is used to describe any infectious microorganism present in the blood and other bodily fluids containing blood. Examples would be hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E, HIV, syphilis, and malaria, and there are many, many more. Those are just some examples. OSHA's bloodborne pathogen standards include the education and training of workers in standard precautions to prevent exposure. It also includes the personal protective equipment that should be available to workers and the monitoring of compliance with the use of these personal protective equipment that are available. The Exposure Control Plan outlines the standard precautions that should be used such as PPE and needle stick safety. The exposure control plan will also outline if there was an exposure, what is to be done. In this exposure control plan, we outline that both the source and the exposed person should be tested. Prophylactic treatment should be given to the patient, and we will talk more about these prophylactic treatments a little bit later. There should be a medical follow-up and a record of the exposure should be filed. These exposures need to be kept by the healthcare facility for 30 years beyond employment. Nosocomial infections are infections acquired by a patient after admission to a healthcare facility. The infection control plan indicates how to break the chain of infection. Hepatitis B vaccine should be available to all employees. New employees should be given vaccination within two weeks of employment. Hepatitis B is given in three doses. There is the initial dose, the second dose is given one month later, and the third dose is given six months from the initial dose. There are also engineering controls, and these controls are an effort to isolate or remove pathogenic dangers from the workplace. We often have needle safety devices and biohazard labels on potentially infectious materials. And this is an example of a biohazard label. Laboratory waste, there are different types of waste 
There is the red hard-sided sharps container, which we would put needles and lancets in. It is important to remember that sharps containers should not be filled over three quarters of the way full or beyond the fill line. The red bag in the cardboard container contains biohazard waste such as blood collection tubes, blood soak bandages, the biohazard contaminated items if the blood is pourable, drippable, spillable, or flakeable. If it is just a drop of blood, this would go into the regular trash can. Glass items, glass slides, glass QC vials also go in this container. In the regular trash can, you would put band-aids, gloves that are not biohazard contaminated, and alcohol pads. If it contains a single drop of blood, if it's not pourable, then those wastes go into the regular trash. And the reason for this is that all biohazard waste in a biohazard container needs to be incinerated after, and facilities are charged by the weight of the waste to dispose of this. So we try and minimize as much as we can. The chain of infection, so the reservoir host then goes to the portal of exit, then goes to the mode of transmission, which goes to the portal of entry, and then a susceptible host, which we will talk about in the next slide. So the reservoir host is any person, animal, any living thing. And the portal of exit is the mouth, skin, rectum, or any type of opening. The mode of transmission could be the air, food, hands, insects, or bodily fluids. We oftentimes will term this as contact, droplet, or ingestion. The portal of entry is any body opening. And this, the susceptible host is one who cannot rid of the pathogen and cannot fight it off. A lot of times I often think of patients who are immunocompromised. Work practice controls. So actions in the laboratory to protect, to protect workers from the exposure of pathogens in blood and bodily fluids. So there is no eating. There is no drinking, and there is no applying of makeup in the areas with a reasonable likelihood of exposure. So when you come to lab, you will not be able to carry in any foods or drinks, lip gloss, and we really try to minimize backpacks, jackets, and you will only be able to carry in the necessary books, a binder, a pencil, or a writing utensil. Outside of that, all other materials should be left outside the lab. So here is the biohazard sign, and as you can see, the three loops, we try to break them up as to how we protect ourselves. So the source, we often protect our source by hand washing, proper disposal of biohazardous waste, decontamination such as a 1 to 10 bleach solution and specimen bagging such as our biohazard bags that we will oftentimes put specimens in after collecting. The host, we will practice standard precautions so proper use of personal protective equipment such as gowns and gloves, face shields, proper immunizations, Important to get the hepatitis B immunization prior to any exposure. Follow OSHA guidelines as far as standard precautions. And develop healthy lifestyles. Transmission, we break this by also hand washing using personal protective equipment such as gloves. Aerosol prevention, sterilizing equipment, and pest control. The CDC stands for Centers of Disease Control. They are responsible for developing standard precautions, which are recommendations for infection control of communicable diseases. You can also see Figure 112 in your book.
for more details. The CDC also comes up with recommendations on proper hand washing procedures and the primary factors, which is a primary factor in infection control. There are a couple ways of hand hygiene, so proper hand washing and the use of proper hand rubs. PPE or personal protective equipment, this includes goggles, face shields, fluid, impermeable grounds, gloves, plexiglass shields are sometimes used in high splash areas. So here is a picture of goggles, face shield, gown, gloves, and then a plexiglass face shield. PPE is the responsibility of the employee to use correct personal protective equipment and follow correct protocols to protect himself or herself from possible exposure incidents. Wearing gloves still requires hand washing. Just because you're wearing gloves doesn't mean that you don't have to hand wash. Standard precautions include hand washing, gloves, masks, eye protection, gowns, patient care equipment, environmental controls, linens, needle stick safety or sharp safety, and patient placement. Standard precautions include universal precautions, which all patients are assumed carriers of bloodborne pathogens. Consider all bodily fluids and moist body substances to be potentially infectious. So hand washing is key. Universal precautions, the definition is the assumption that blood or bodily fluids contain blood from any patient or test kit could be infectious. Standard precautions, so wear gloves whenever in contact with bodily fluids is possible. Wear gowns if clothing is likely to be contaminated with bodily fluids. Wear a mask if there is a risk of being splashed with bodily fluids. Wash hands between patients and needles have a safety feature and are discarded in a sharps container. There is no recapping and typically when we use the safety devices on the needles we use another object to press that safety down or we use the one-handed technique to enable that safety device. Glove removal, never let the exterior of the glove come in contact with exposed skin. Take off the first glove with the other hand. Then hold the first glove in the gloved hand while turning the second glove inside out with the free ungloved hand. Hand washing or alcohol based hand rubs. Wash with soap and water if visibly soiled and after the use of the bathroom it's important to use warm running water and friction. Use alcohol based hand rubs or hand washing when leaving the lab after removing gloves in between patients before eating or drinking and immediately after accidental skin contact with blood or bodily fluids. There are different re government regulations that have taken place. Occupational Exposure to Bloodborne Pathogen Exposure Control Plan of 1991 requires all employees to practice standard precautions, provide lab coats, gowns, face shields and gloves to employees in laundry facilities for non-disposable protective clothing and provide sharps disposal containers and prohibiting recapping of needles. Also in the government regulations prohibiting eating, drinking, smoking, or applying cosmetics in work areas, labeling all biohazard materials and cont containers, providing immunizations of hepatitis B free of charge, and establishing a daily work surface infection protocol. The disinfectant of choice for bloodborne pathogens is sodium hypochlorite or household bleach freshly diluted. So one parts bleach and 10 parts water. 
And so once you get into class, you will, and this needs to be fresh daily. So once you get into class, you will pour one part of the spray bottle container with bleach and then fill the rest of the container with water to create your solution. It is important after each and every lab that tables and chairs are sprayed down and wiped down with the 1 to 10 bleach solution to kill all microorganisms that you might have been working with in the lab that day. Other government regulations provide medical follow-up to employees who have been accidentally exposed to bloodborne pathogens, document regular training of employees in safety standards, enforce standards, document evaluations and implementation of safer needle devices, involve employees in the selection and evaluation of new devices, and maintain a log of all injuries from contaminated sharps. Procedures after exposure to blood, so wash or flush the area with soap and water immediately, report the incident immediately to the supervisor, supervisor, file an incident report, and you can see an incident report on page 213 of your textbook, and seek medical attention for evaluation of risks. Needle stick initial procedures, baseline blood sample for employees, and they test for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, identify source of patients. Sometimes the source is unknown, and sometimes we do know the patient if it happens right in front of the patient, and test for the source. We test the source for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Testing must be completed within 24 hours of the exposure, and prophylaxis and counseling must be offered. Source patients test positive for HIV. Employee is counseled about receiving post-exposure prophylaxis. Medications are started within 24 hours. Employees are retested in intervals of 6 weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, and 52 weeks, mainly because HIV has quite the incubation period. Post-exposure prophylaxis, so each BV for unvaccinated employees can be given hepatitis B immunoglobulin and the hepatitis B vaccine. Vaccinated employees are tested for immunity and receive post-exposure prophylaxis if necessary. Hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus, we give the immunoglobulin hepatozyme and alpha interferon. In HIV, we often give antiretroviral medications in order to prevent the likelihood of contracting these diseases. It is said that if these prophylactic measures are taken, the risk of contracting these diseases is very minimal. <laughs>